Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Ethics Experts. I'm your host, Giovanni Gallo, and I'm excited to review with you today the book, The Power of Ethics by Susan Liautoud, How to Make Good Choices in a Complicated World. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, then welcome to the show. This is The Ethics Experts. If you're a subscriber or uh, a multiple time listener, then welcome to The Ethics Experts. I'm really glad you're here. And that's what you get with The Ethics Experts, an extra special welcome if you subscribe. So maybe think about doing that. Susan, welcome to the show today. I'm so glad to have you on. How are you doing? Very well, thanks. And thanks so much for having me. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm super excited to get into it. Um, this is my favorite book on ethics that I've read in at least over a year. Um, I'm really excited to jump into it. But um, before we get into all of the great stuff in there, we like to show the personal side of ethics here. So let's start about talking about you personally, Susan. Um, tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to the point where you wrote this book. So I started my professional career as a corporate lawyer at Sullivan and Cromwell, uh, largely in New York and Paris, so a big Wall Street firm. And the fantastic part of that experience was that I learned how to think. I didn't learn how to box tick. And I was very lucky that I arrived at the firm at a time where there were a lot of what I called first ever questions. So I was right away, even from a very young lawyer, thrown into what happens when we need to convince the regulators of what the law should be. Um, and big global transactions. So I was also immediately very aware of just how different cultures um, from different countries interpret law, think about law, and think about what ethical or unethical might mean. Fast forward seven years, um, I had to move from Paris back to California. Uh, my husband had to move, and Sullivan and Cromwell didn't have an office there. So with a great deal of luck, I landed uh, at Stanford Law School, and I became an associate dean for international and graduate programs. And there I expanded my thinking even further. It was the early days of technology. So I started to see that there was a lot happening in the world, but there wasn't a lot of law that was regulating it. And to be honest, at the time, there wasn't a lot of thinking about the ethics of it. Um, and I also started teaching courses on global NGOs. So I taught a mix of international business transactions and global NGOs. And I was very keen to demonstrate that ethics are not different in an NGO world versus a corporate world versus technology versus our personal life. So we don't have different kinds of ethics in different places. Uh, and that was the beginning of my thinking on that. And then finally, um, had to move again, uh, moved to London, uh, started a nonprofit organization to advise um, and largely pro bono organizations on strategy and ethics and governance and did my PhD in governance and accountability. That was kind of, those were the buzzwords of the day. Uh, and then started really thinking about focusing in on ethics and in particular ethics above and beyond the law. So what I talk about in the book as the ethics edge, uh, the kinds of areas, whether it's technology or biotechnology or even very human challenges where there is no law. Uh, and in some cases there probably shouldn't be law. And in other cases, it's that the law simply hasn't caught up. Um, and then here I am uh, with my mission of democratizing ethics, and that's, and that's the mission of the book, to try to make all of this accessible to people from all walks of life and at all levels of organizations. That's awesome, Susan, and I'm so glad um, that you've had that, all that career experience that led to this book. Um, I really can't recommend it highly enough. Um, all of our listeners should go get the book and check it out. Um, it, was, it was cool to me how... Um, compelling it was, yet it was still interesting. It was like you, you bring some big ideas and you put, you put forth some powerful frameworks, but it doesn't read like a textbook. It reads like a really interesting discussion of this very important topic. So thanks for writing the book, Susan. Thank you. And indeed, that was part of my thinking, which is that ethics really is about stories uh, and hmm. how well or not so well we integrate ethics into our decision determines our professional stories, determines our personal stories, determines the story trajectories of companies, um, and also determines the impact we have on other people's stories. So I was very keen to make it not a textbook. Um, on the one hand, very straightforward takeaways that you don't have to work to remember that just become a habit by the time you finish the book. Um, but on the other hand, to sort of demonstrate how stories are driven by ethics for better or for worse. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I think you did it really well in the book, and uh, there's really so much that I want to jump into. Um, as we kind of get warmed up into the book, talk to me a little bit. You know, you 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 made a few different points and different stories you were telling about how 
the challenge for ethics um, is a little bit different now than maybe it was 20 and 50 years ago. There's some things going on in our world um, that bring up new challenges. Listen, you know, ethics is still the same as, as it's always been. It's, you know, trying to do the right thing, taking into consideration all of your kind of decisions and, and stakeholders and things like that. But I think the forum that um, we're making decisions in about ethics is different now. Um, and there's some new challenges coming at us. Can, can you talk to me a little bit about how the timing for this book, um, you know, maybe compelled you or brought up some, some different things than would have been in the conversation 50 years ago? Sure. So one of the things is that um, we are increasingly aware of stakeholders, and we see that in a lot of different places. Uh, the business roundtable and increasingly corporate executives are thinking about all of the different stakeholders in their decisions. But the big difference today that we often don't think about, except in certain areas like climate change, is that the decisions we make today, and in particular with technology, can have an effect on people we will never meet, people we can't even identify, and indeed sometimes people who are not alive today, so future generations. So an example of that uh, that I give in the book is the gene editing. Um, we can have responsible gene editing. For example, um, some of the scientists today in the U.S. are trying to develop ways to use it to cure cancer, or we can have irresponsible use of the technology like the rogue scientist in China, Hu Jinkui, who edited the embryos of twin girls. Um, and that will, you know, if he, do, if he did what he actually says he did, and I'm understanding the scientists correctly, will affect the human germline. Um, similarly, there's a lot in artificial intelligence that can potentially affect uh, future generations. So our notion of stakeholders is much broader. Another way the world has completely shifted today is that we are used to having sometimes gaps in information. You know, we don't always get to know everything we wish we could in order to make decisions. But today, the gap in information is so much bigger. And sometimes it's because we just can't know. The scientists don't even know. They don't even understand exactly how the artificial intelligence works, for example. And sometimes uh, it's because the cost of knowing, um, whether it's human resources or financial resources, is just too great. But we're navigating a lot of unknowns. Uh, and what that means is that we can't sort of rest on our laurels. We can't make a decision and then just kind of move on to the next one. We have to be constantly monitoring. So those are a couple of the ways that the world has changed today. And then finally, I would say the gap in um, the law, you know, the law is lagging so far behind the realities that we live in. And as technology accelerates, the law is just lagging further and further behind. So that space where the responsibility for ethics exists is getting bigger and bigger because we're not getting much guidance or protection from the law. Yeah, there's so much there, Susan, and I appreciate you kind of lay, laying it out. I think that a lot of our audience um, maybe bump up against different pieces of this, the, you know, the expanding notion of stakeholders and how wide that is across not just geography, but culture and time and stuff like that. Um, you know, there are more questions, things are moving quickly, so we don't have all the answers. And, um, you know, and, and I think that lag for the law is, I, I think it pops up in a lot of our individual practices as, you know, uh, the job that we're in or the advice that we're giving or something like that. Um, but you have a great, you do a great job of kind of boiling that down and saying, hey, here's what's actually going on right now. And here's why in some cases, ethics is maybe harder than it used to be. And in some cases, you know, that even means that it's more important than it used to be. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I love um, the frame that you get for this. You know, you, you come from a bit of a legal background, but you've always, um, you know, it seems from, uh, from your description kind of been thinking beyond checking the box um, your whole career, there, there's a lot that maybe, you know, in a few generations of ethics ago, people kind of looked to the law and said, okay, well, the law is going to define this and this is going to kind of get me most of the way there. That gap of, you know, and maybe that the law is delayed, like you said, or, or it may be just, you know, kind of something that's unregulated and, you know, we don't know what to do with it. That gap needs to be filled by ethics, right? If we just stop at the law, then we're only doing what the law forces us to do. That doesn't define what's right. That just defines how much of that has been consolidated under a regulator to kind of, you know, have a common denominator of action. But ethics becomes so much more important as that gap gets bigger to say, okay, well, what is actually right that, you know, Congress or regulators haven't figured out how to script into a law yet, but it's the right thing to do and I need to do it. And what you're saying is really important. And there's sort of two corollaries, if I may. One is that um, looking at all this ethics 
you know, the decision making, because really what I'm talking about in the book boils down to decision making. And it can be decision making by the CEO or the board, and it can be decision making um, by somebody who's responsible for making sure um, that the right ordering is done in the, in the company cafeteria. It can be anybody in the organization can make better decisions. Um, and this thinking about how we make decisions that is accessible at all levels of an organization also actually goes back and helps people understand even the compliance part of it, the strictly legal part of it. So it can have a positive effect on that as well. Um, but the other part of it is that it causes us to question our own power. We have a lot more power to contribute than we ever thought. And again, I'll come mm -hmm. back to people at all levels of an organization. And very often what happens when I'm advising organizations is that particularly if I'm working with senior management or the board, there's often a lot of discussion about transparency, like let everybody else know what the senior management is thinking. And I'm sure um, many of your colleagues and listeners who are chief compliance officers and general counsels have had this experience. And so one of the things the book is trying to do is to say, if you think about um, these six forces that drive pretty much any ethical decision we might make, that becomes a common language and, and management can speak to people of all levels of organization and they can start to constructively speak, you know, and express their own views um, in a way that it improves communication within an organization. Yeah, it's great. It can become this common language, right? If you're not in the board meeting or you, you know, you don't geek out on regu regulations and kind of look through the whole thing mm -hmm. to kind of figure out what your company should do about, you know, this new fraud regulation. If you're not in those conversations at those levels, we can bring everybody into this story about ethics and kind of how our company or organization, NGO, whatever it is, need, needs to act. Exactly. Um, so uh, I got one more kind of general question and then uh, I'm going to have to try to pick which of my, the dog ears in your book um, I really want to go through because there's so much good stuff here. Um, but talk to me about this concept um, that is really kind of your banner of democratizing ethics. I think we were just talking a little bit about mm -hmm. it, but I think it's a really powerful concept to get this thing that we call ethics that we all want our organizations and our people and our communities to be more ethical. Um, I, I think you're, you're hitting on a you know, potential restriction or a p potential growth point that we need to do to, democr to democratize ethics. Tell, tell me about that. So um, my personal mission and the mission of the book and, and all of my work is really to make ethical decision-making accessible to everybody. Um, we all have the power to contribute. So on a political level, uh, when we talk about all the threats to democracy that have been in the news recently, when we talk about um, destroying trust and the like, um, we, you know, we all are going to have to contribute to restore our nation's moral foundation. No president or vice right. president, irrespective of one's politics, can do it alone. And similarly, yeah. no corporate CEO or board or senior management team or chief compliance officer can do it alone. We each have an enormous amount of power. Now, with that comes responsibility. So we also, if we just take it on a personal level, we have access to things like Facebook. We have access to things like um, uh, Robin Hood has been in the news recently. There's a, there's a lot that we have um, access to that we also need to think about what are what is our own contribution to how we use these things. And I get questions on everything from is it okay to share your Netflix password or your Netflix account with you know your 20 friends if you're a, if you're a college student to really what is the you know misuse of social media and all the like. So our our ethical responsibility comes up in every dimension of our lives. And the learning from the book applies across all those dimensions. And it really does apply to people from all walks of life. You don't have to have any particular title or level of education in order to be able to um, have the framework in the book quickly become a reflex and see how it operates in your own life. Yeah, it's great. I really love that perspective. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, I, I tend to think that this concept of ethics is somewhat universal, right? Like we all, uh, behave in ways that affect other stakeholders and, and need to do that right. But um, the way that that's being communicated um, and interacted across company lines, state lines, you know, uh, organizations and cultures, I think really brings this more to the forefront that everyone needs to be a part of this. It's not just, you know, that, you know, that big CEO making a decision, um, you know, in the boardroom, and then that's kind of the ethical decision that matters all of us on the front lines making, you know, contributing to Facebook, going on Reddit, 
you know, uh, putting something in the company survey or going to a protest or whatever, we all have a lot of that power that you talked about that, you know, whether we had it before and didn't realize it, or, you know, we, we have it because of, you know, the technology platforms and stuff like that, we all have a lot of power to make an impact on our world. And I think that that compels all of us to pick up this banner of ethics and say, okay, well, what is my actual proper contribution here? Not just, you know, is, is there anything I'm going to get in trouble with, with the law that I think that that's happening no, absolutely. On, a, on a consumer and a citizen basis, not just at the company level. And you just got to know about ethics if you're on a board. I love the way you just expressed that about consumer and citizen. Um, and I also love the examples you gave because there's no one right way, right? Some people um, are, you know, hopefully we're all really meticulous about wearing masks uh, with COVID. Um, but some people are going to be more inclined to pay more attention to every last plastic water bottle and others are going to be demonstrating and others are going to be, um, you know, doing something at work or, but there's so many different ways we can contribute. And it's all about, this more positive approach, as you say. And I say very clearly in the book that blame and shame and guilt have no place in ethics. They're unconstructive yeah. and they actually create ethics problems. They don't create ethics solutions. That's so powerful. Um, it's, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because I had it highlighted and I wanted to get to it. So let's talk about that a little bit because there's a lot in our industry as you know, prof professional ethics practitioners, as compliance officers, um, as HR directors that um, I think there's a lot that is kind of steeped into our culture about policy enforcement and about, you know, making sure someone kind of checks the box on these certain things um, that that blame and that shame and that guilt, I think at times can be our like default voice. So talk to me about how that can be counterproductive in ethics. I love it. Okay. So first of all, none of us is perfect. Okay. My hand up first. We all make mistakes. We all have moments where with the best of intentions, you know, our judgment just goes off the rails. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things I most worry about in organizations is getting the balance right between absolutely speaking up against something like racism. You know, that is, I say in the book, we're in, in the gray zone. That's not gray. That's binary, right. unacceptable all the time. But on the other hand, we may unintentionally say something that offends someone um, and it is so much more constructive to say, you know, I understood what you just said to mean this. Is that really what you meant? And give someone a chance to walk it back and not create a culture where people are afraid to speak up because that's the single biggest risk is if, you, if people feel that they're in an environment of blame and shame and guilt, that's where you get fear. That's where you get a lot of the drivers that I talk about in the book, the drivers of contagion of unethical behavior. You get fear, you get information silos, you get skewed incentives, you get all the things that drive ethics under the rug because people are so um, you know, worried about ducking the blame, shame, and guilt. Um, but it's also just not kind. It's not the kind of place people want to go to work and where people actually do their best work. And just to be very concrete for a minute, one of the ways to get away from blame, shame, and guilt is to yeah. be very clear where you can be very clear. So you know, we have a lot of areas I talked about where, you know, we're on this ethics edge, as I call it, um, and things are not that clear. We're still trying to figure things out. But there are some areas that are very clear. And one person who does this really brilliantly, who you had on your show, is my friend Rob Chestnut. And he'll say yeah. things like, you know, you get to ask someone out once. Once means once. It doesn't mean one and a half times, right? So right. Rob is fantastic at, you know, he's, he's fantastic at a lot of things. But he's fantastic at saying... Let's put a simple rule so we know what's clear and we know what isn't clear, where we have a lot of challenge in gray that we have to navigate. Um, but the other thing is to make sure, and I know that HR professionals and compliance professionals, we have to be very careful what we reward and to be very careful that we don't reward finger pointing, you know, guilt inducing behavior, threatening behavior, and certainly not shame. And, you know, in one place we've seen shame outside of the corporate world is, and in particular in England, is this um, epidemic of shaming people who um, don't obey by COVID regulations. So one of the ministers in the UK said, call people out, put them on social media, et cetera. You know, I mean, that, that has gotten us absolutely nowhere except right. you know, creating friction between neighbors who need each other in this terrible time. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's so much about that negative push um, that puts someone on the defensive that puts us into two different camps 
oh, you really care about this and I care about it a little bit, but you say that I don't. So then I'm going to kind of live into that. Um, and it's so destructive. I'm, you know, I'm sure, you know, uh, better than I do that there's, there's a lot of uh, psychology around kind of negative and positive reinforcement and that negative can be powerful, but it's so short term, right? And it doesn't build community. It doesn't build, um, you know, doesn't kind of bring people back into the fold. Um, and, you know, listen, in an extreme case, you know, repeated racism, extreme violence in the workplace, then it's going to be negative. You're going to, you know, kick somebody out of the office. And it's going to be binary. It's like there, there is zero yeah. tolerance there. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's definitely stuff that's zero tolerance, but, you know, to your point, when we're on the edge, when we're in a gray zone, when people maybe have the best intentions, but they need to be educated a little bit more on the diversity issue or whatever it is, we can get a lot more by saying, hey, you're probably not trying to be like this. This kind of comes across this way. Here's how we like to do this. Or, you know, uh, here's, here's what we appreciate that, you know, people are trying or whatever it is. Um, we can get a lot more people on board and running in the right direction, which is really a big thing that I think in the ethics profession, we're trying to figure out now, trying to get past the kind of the stuff that I can get done with a stick and figure out what I can do with a carrot because that's the edge that's going to get a culture of ethics. That's the edge that's going to get the whole organization saying, hey, you know what? I love when compliance comes by because they keep me from tripping over myself and then I can run faster in the right direction instead of just saying no all the time. And I think it's really just, it's very astute. You kind of, you, you really kind of boiled it down to something that we trip over a lot. You know, this blame and shame and guilt um, can seem like the obvious thing and can seem like, hey, well, I'm going to be very clear about that. Um, but, I th but I think when you push us to say, okay, well, what can we cl be clear about that's positive? What can we say, okay, well, we're, you know, we're not sure every decision, how it's going to, how it's going to fall out here, but here's our kind of order of operations. Here's, here are our values. We're going to make sure everyone's safe. We're going to try to make sure that everyone can come to work. And then we're going to see how we can kind of move the business forward throughout this pandemic or something like that. That's, you know, mm -hmm. that's a framework where you can say, hey, here's what's most important. So we're not going to sacrifice your safety for dollars or what, whatever it is. And you can say, well, we're going to be clear about this and we're going to interpret other things in light of this instead of saying, oh, well, I don't know how I'm going to decide in every situation. So I'll let you know. Yeah. And another thing is to sort of unite everybody behind looking for opportunity and then being very clear about where there's risk. And in particular, okay. the really unacceptable risk, you know, human life is at stake kind of risk. Um, right. So, um, and if we start to think in terms of opportunity and risk and you get teams of people thinking about how they can create opportunity, I can promise you that ethics opens up a lot of doors. There's a lot you can do if you're integrating ethics into your decision-making, whether you're the one executing, whether you're the HR partner, or the compliance leaders or the board. Um, and then also thinking about the risk side and part of ethics will be how can you mitigate the risks and how can you distinguish between some risks that may just be worth taking because the innovations can be so powerfully positive or the, the opportunities can be so positive and some risks that are just absolutely unacceptable. And all of a sudden um, you get people thinking about problem solving in terms of opportunity and risk instead of, as I said, finger pointing. Right. Um, yeah. And when, you know, we like to say at, in, in our culture here at Compliance Line, we, we expect that we hire ad adults. We expect that people like have a brain in their head, have a heart in their chest. We're going to assume positive intent and empower people to make good decisions, not, hey, come check with us if you need to use that fork in the lobby or whatever. Just like we expect you to be adults. We we're going to give you the framework for what matters. And then we're going to deal with stuff on the edges that like, oh, we hadn't, we hadn't considered that, you know, the conflation of those variables, let's kind of figure it out. But I think when you treat people like adults, instead of like, here's a list of 800 steps that you need to make sure that you follow every day, um, you can bring them into this conversation and the story and say, hey, we're trying to do the right thing. There are going to be some trade-offs. We'll figure them out together. What you just said about bring them into the conversation and the story is exactly the heart of the book and the democratizing ethics. It's saying that we value your voice. There isn't one voice that gets to determine the ethics for the world. Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, and, and that just gets people thinking. It gets people participating in ways that they wouldn't. It gets people in co-creating the story. Yes. Um, and so, so I want to jump into, um, in, your, in your Banishing the Binary chapter, you give a really good um, uh, four-step framework, which I think really helps us democratize ethics and say, 
hey, everyone can walk through this framework and you're going to get pretty close to either a decision or understanding, hey, I can't make this decision because I need a little bit more. So that starts with uh, kind of what are my guiding principles and then goes into do I have the information I need to make this decision? And then uh, where do you bring us next? Number three is who or what stakeholders matter to my decision? And then we finish what are the potential consequences of my decision in the short, medium and long term? So we could spend a half hour just discussing that, but I wanted to bring that framework in and you know, uh, welcome you to comment on it. I thought it was a really good thing that you know, I could sit down in a 15 minute meeting with some people on my team and say, hey, here's what you need to step through. We'll kind of figure out the detail around question number two and how do we answer that if you get stuck. But I thought it was a really good framework of like, if you tick through that, you're gonna be pretty close to at, you know, maybe knowing where the sticky wickets are or maybe just kind of getting to a decision you say, okay, I, I can kind of move forward in, on the next step. I love the framework. No, thank you. And, and actually it's four words that, you know, even if I give a talk in a corporation, by the time I'm done with the talk, people say that the four words are just ingrained in how they think. So there's no memorization required. There's no extra work required. Um, I've mentioned a little bit earlier about information and stakeholders. Let me just say a word about consequences. Um, yes. there, are two, there are two things about the way we integrate our thinking about consequences. One is that I'm really arguing that we need to take short, medium, and long-term consequences into consideration all at the time of our decision. It's very mm -hmm. hard to do that in a crisis mode. Here we are in COVID. Okay. Um, we are, you know, democracy is in crisis. There are many uh, sort of concurrent crises right now. But we really need to discipline ourselves to be short, medium, and long-term all at the same time. And yeah. what often we have become is serial short-termists. So an example of that is sort of the corporate quarterly profits and sales numbers and things like that. But there are many variations of that. People think, well, I'm going to think about what's best for me for this week, and I'll come back next Sunday, and I'll think about next week, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that's one part of consequences. But the other is just to give the, your listeners, and I, and leaders work with this all the time with me, um, a very simple tool is to think about which consequences are both really important and irreparable. Yeah. So, you know, I'll give you the example that I give in the book is, you know, Boeing had these tragic crashes in Indonesia and Ethiopia within months of each other. Nobody could explain those crashes. And then President Trump was being asked to keep Boeing planes in the air with no explanation for those crashes. Now, clearly, another plane crash is both critically important and irreparable. So, you know, that should have been a clue right then and there that that was not the right path forward. Um, and then, and, you know, indeed, 65 or so countries shut down Boeing and P President Trump said no. So, um, so it was, you know, there was a lot of agreement. Um, but in many cases, you know, our decision, one of the ways to get insights into our decisions quite quickly is to think about those two aspects of the consequences. Um, yeah. what, is, what is important and irreparable? Um, yeah, it's a really good framework. It reminds me of something that I, that I use on our team. Um, I think I bought, borrowed it from the leaders at Square, where um, if, if a decision can be reversed, and if a decision is not like disastrous, then we can probably take the next step and move forward, right? So like, if it's not irreparable, or, and, or it's not something that you can kind of come off of, then you can move forward on it. And I think that, uh, you know, you bring up a good point that in a crisis, that might be, you know, you might not be able to go through an 18 step framework, but you can kind of look at that and say, okay, is, is there anything here that is a clear guardrail that like, okay, I'm going to fall off the cliff over there. I shouldn't go that way. Um, and mm -hmm. then, you know, I think that when, uh, when you have the time or you have the information, you can kind of step through the fuller framework um, where you walk through principles, information, stakeholders, and consequences. Um, and then by the time you get to those consequences, then you can kind of look at that irreparable piece. Yeah. Am, I, am I getting that right? But even, you know, yeah, absolutely. But even so, um, the, even the full framework in my case is four words. It's not an 18 step framework, as you say. Sure. And indeed, when I go, yeah. one of the things that happens to me when I'm advising organizations, including sort of global NGOs, is that people will come at me with these three things that look like three dimensional tic-tac-toe boards. And yeah. they're kind of, you have to jump through all these different hoops. I mean, you almost have to be sort of like a design specialist or, I mean, you, you have to have like a three-week offsite that you can dedicate your <laughs> ethics discussion to. And right. so I'm really trying to get away from that because every, for, for a couple of reasons. One is that means you know, nobody has the time for that. Um, mm -hmm. That also requires a level of expertise that excludes 
so many people from the decision process and even so many people from understanding the decision process. So even if the yeah. leaders are making a decision, if they've done it that way, you'd be amazed at how difficult it is to communicate it in a way that the rest of the company um, or the rest of the stakeholders actually understand it. So that's why I am, I'm committed to this forward um, approach. Yeah, I love it. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm just kind of letting that soak in here, Susan, that when we bring these complex frameworks, you know, if you can't explain it to, some, to someone like they're five, you effectively mm -hmm. exclude people from the conversation, exclude them from the story and say, hey, well, you know, we decided to close the plant and uh, everyone's getting furloughed and it's really complex. There's, there's a bunch of stuff that went into it, but you wouldn't understand it. So just trust me, uh, we're doing it, you know, for the good of the company or something. Well, if you can't explain your thinking to somebody, then, you know, like I know that the reality is a bunch of people are going to backfill with like worst case scenarios are going to be worried about, well, like, I know they said that, but it might be this other thing. Um, and when we rely on overly complex kind of routes to a decision, uh, it really shrinks the room of the people who can really buy into that decision. It's really, it's, uh, it's a, it's a really big point that I think may, may frequently keep us from being the effective leaders that we want to be. And, uh, you know, your words, just trust are really important. People are not willing anymore to quote, just trust as you so uh, importantly point out. And we see yeah. that in a number of different ways. We see that in um, employee responses. So Amazon employees demonstrating on the environment or Google employees demonstrating when there was um, an issue around selling um, certain technologies mm -hmm. to the military. And so if, if employees and other stakeholders can't understand the reasoning behind the decision and can't share, use the same language as leaders to have a dialogue you're going to get all of these kinds of problems. You're going to get two sides instead of a discussion. Um, and so that's one very practical, um, very practical point. But the other is that we're already in a world where technology is so complex that it is being lodged in the brains of a very few experts and controllers of technology. So those who can understand the workings of AI, and I am not one yeah. who understands the technical <laughs> workings of AI, right? But what I tell yeah. people is that I don't need to understand the technical workings of, you know, certain kinds of coding or the way algorithms work to have a point of view on the ethics any more than I need to understand how the electricity in my hairdryer works or, you know, how a co an internal combustion engine works to know that I don't want 12 year olds driving or drunk driving. Right. right? right. So. Um, so, again, I think this um, the, the point you emphasized about exclusion is really important. Uh, yeah, I think um, it, I, I, I think it continues to make the case for what we're talking about that as the complexity of decisions increases, right? We're in this world where, you know, companies operate in hundreds of countries and, you know, uh, the supply chain is so long, you're not even sure who your customer is and stuff like that. Um, because it's harder, it increases the, the demand or the charge on us to say, okay, well, we need to bring more people into this conversation because we don't want them just kind of sitting in the dark wondering, you know, when something bad is going to happen to them. And as ethics practitioners, we can open that conversation up and say, okay, I know we just had a three-day offsite to decide this. We need to spend 20 minutes figuring out what, what the big bullet points are that we settled on that we can communicate to some people so they know what we're talking about. And it's not just an edict from, you know, the ivory tower. No, exactly. And so, and, and hopefully in a language or one of the ways my framework can be used is in a language that people can respond using the framework so that yeah. it becomes a discussion as opposed to somebody gives a bunch of bullet points and then people respond completely off targeting because they're not really included in the reasoning. Right. They're just kind of being yeah. handed, as you say, an edict. Yeah. And you can kind of tell by their responses whether, whether they actually buy into it and they get it, right? Like if they're asking mm -hmm. questions that are from left field, maybe they don't understand it, or maybe they understand it and you're just not talking about the thing that matters. But if you get into that conversation, if you ask for some feedback, if you walk around a little bit and say, hey, how's this thing being accepted? Um, you can tell whether it's working or not. And that should be a red flag if there's not clear communication going back and forth, you know, kind of asking questions that are relevant to the stuff that you brought up or, you know, kind of repeating it back to you of like, yeah, I understand it to be this way. If you're not getting those reactions, then you're probably not communicating well. It's so much about ethics these days 
is about communication and that conversation because it's not it's not single faceted. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot about communicating the gray. It's communicating what we don't know. Um, and a really mm. good example of that is COVID, right? I mean, when, yes. when I'm working with organizations now to think about their COVID, the ethics of their COVID policy, how do you welcome employees back to work? Are you going to have mandatory vaccines irrespective of the law? You know, and if not, you know, let's get away from binary again, not mandatory or not mandatory, but, you know, sort of what are what is the overall package of safety and ethics and voice that we can give for employees? Um, there's a lot we don't know. We don't know the long term effects of the disease. We don't know whether the vaccine is going to be safe or effective for under 16 year olds. We don't know whether the vaccine prevents transmission. So some of these, you know, we don't uh, we, we need to be focused. We need to tell people what we don't know that matters to them. Not everything yeah. we don't know, but really start thinking when we communicate about what is going to matter to the person receiving the information. Uh, and by and by matter, I mean, how how are they going to how is it going to change their opinion of it or how is it going to change the choices they make? Yeah. Um, and I think that that's something that I think we as humans and maybe, you know, uh, specifically in the ethics space, we're kind of uncomfortable talking about what we don't know. We're uncomfortable standing from a place of authority and saying, hey, everyone, I don't have it all figured out. When in reality, we know that that's what happens, right? Like if you're in a board meeting, it's a bunch of people sitting around being like, uh, I don't know, what should we do next quarter? You know what I'm saying? Like if you're in a committee, then you kind of go around and see what people think and try to make your best decision. I mean, we're all kind of operating on the edge of some stuff that we have to figure out. That's why we have jobs. That's why we have brains. That's why we're knowledge workers. Um, but like, I get your point. There's there, it's, it's hard for us to open that up and say, Hey, okay, well, I, I'm supposed to give you the answer. I don't really have the answer right now, so we're going to have to walk through this together. Right, and there's a very big difference between I don't have the answer because science hasn't caught up. So that's the COVID example, right? Or right. I don't have the answer because I just haven't done my homework. And that is yes. trust destroying, right? We do have a right mm. to expect of our leaders, corporate leaders, political yeah. leaders, et cetera, that they do their homework, that they understand the facts, uh, and that they're coming to us with decisions that are fact-based. And this, this whole idea of being straight with people about what we know and what we don't know is part of a bigger challenge of committing to truth. You know, there can't be any ethics okay. without truth. And I think that's, mm -hmm. where, that's where that fits in. Um, yeah, that's a great point. Um, you're going you're gonna to wreck a lot of trust if you say, hey, this really important decision, I haven't really spent any time on it yet, so I don't really know what's going on in it. Um, you know, maybe that's a good thing for us to hold on to, like, if you haven't done your homework, then you should feel bad about saying, I don't know. But if you've done it and this is, this is the best you got, well, let's communicate now instead of waiting nine months until some more science is settled. Let's tell people how they need to act tomorrow and next week and we'll kind of modify as we go. Exactly. That's the monitoring point, you know, and that's what I was saying earlier about our gap in information today on the edge, as I call it, is bigger yeah. than it was. Um, your really good first question about what's different today and that, you know, and that holds us to account for monitoring. We just, you know, we're just, that's just the way the world is today. We can't just sort of, you know, hold our nose and leap and then go on to the next decision. Yes, exactly. So um, uh, I want to jump into the pillars. I want to talk a little bit about the three pillars and then let's spend a minute on, uh, you know, your, uh, your supposition that, that in, in certain forums, some of those pillars are crumbling. So you talk about the three pillars that support ethical decision making are transparency, informed consent, and effective listening. I thought that uh, those, those are probably not the three I would have picked up front, but they, I, I, they're better than I would have picked them saying because it really encompasses that whole thing. Um, so tell me about those three pillars and how they're important for good decision making. So transparency is a word that's been around for a while. Um, sort of we, we've gone through over the last decade kind of phases of new words. We had accountability around Enron, for example. You know, um, transparency has been a big one in the past. It sort of preceded ethics. Um, but pr transparency means that you give someone information that they need to make their best decision. Uh, you give them information that in securities law terms would be material, but in a way that they can understand it. It's not you've just dumped a bunch of information on them. It's that you've, they actually understand it. Um, so a simple example of that is cigarette packages that say smoking kills. Um, okay. 
an example, you know, we heard Jack Dorsey when, when some of the tech CEOs were invited, shall I say, to Washington. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> and he said, you know, very candidly, um, if you sat down with Twitter's terms of service and a cup of coffee, it was something along the lines of you, you wouldn't enjoy yourself and you probably wouldn't understand it. Um, and a more recent example that may try to be transparency, but in my view is not, is um, Robin Hood's terms of service are 33 pages of microprint that even after my um, good training from Sullivan and Cromwell writing underwriting agreements that were hundreds of pages, I honestly do not understand what they mean for me. So transparency is critical. Um, Informed consent is basically what it says on the package. Are you informed before you give consent? So we're used to, uh, to come back to your focus on trust, we're used to things like we sign a consent form to send our children on school field trips. We basically trust the school. We basically know that they're going to go to this place and they have these risks and we're kind of comfortable that, you know, it's a great opportunity and pretty limited risks. What's happening today is that in part because transparency isn't working so well, um, Mm -hmm. we have a lot of problems around the informed part. So the consent part is no longer valid. So, um, one of the ways this comes up is that we aren't, we aren't being given the information in a form we can understand it. So that's all the terms of service problems and social media companies right. and the like. But beyond that, sometimes we're being asked to consent to things that we really can't understand. Like if you were going to get on one of Elon Musk's rocket ships, you know, there's a chance you wouldn't come back. No sane human being can really give informed consent to a one-way Uh, ticket, right? I mean, it's a very high risk thing. So the processes of informed consent for that need to be very different. Um, And the Mm. example I use in the book is 23andMe. You know, 23andMe can bring a lot of good, like many of the innovations and a lot of access. But what happens when you're learning all kinds of information that you can't unknow? Most people really can't quite understand what it is to learn that they might have a genetic propensity for a terrible disease and even worse, one that could affect their children. Um, that, you know, so before you kind of sign on the dotted line or click, I agree, you know, how, can, how do you really inform someone of that? You don't just give them words, right? Um, so that whole thing is kind of, that's what I mean by crumbling. It's very, very difficult to properly inform someone. The way it used to happen in the genetic testing is that a doctor would prescribe a test. And first of all, it would be a test only for one or two things or a few limited things, not just, you know, a whole battery of tests. And also the doctor would interpret the results for you. So you don't just get something in the mail that says all of this kind of, you know, difficult to understand results. So that's the second one. The third is a kind of classic age old problem that all of us. And again, you know, my hand up first, we all could do better at listening. And what I mean specifically in the ethics space is to listen to what people are really telling us, not what we think they should be telling us or what we think they should mean uh, or what they think they, you know, or what we think they must be feeling. And that's right. the same thing about whether we're listening to people who voted one way or the other in the election, or we're listening to people in a company who reacted in a certain way or who said certain things. We very often listen with preconceived ideas. Um, And an example of that is young doctors. Um, What I hear from hospital ethics experts is that young doctors very often are so sure that they've got these potential diagnoses in mind and they have a patient in front of them and they're not recognizing, oh, the patient is from, you know, Japan or the patient is from India and they might be expressing themselves in a way that culturally can affect what they really have or mean. Um, and so, so they're just so concerned with matching what they think they see to what to the diagnosis they've been trained to identify that they're not actually listening to what the patients are really telling them. Um, mm. But this is just a, it was a broader um, a broader challenge, especially when a lot of our listening is reduced to tweets and texts and emojis. Right? What right. we're listening to is is greatly reduced. And sometimes we have to sort of press pause and say, I can't understand what you mean from an emoji. <laughs> yeah, we need to get on the phone, uh, maybe a video call and figure out what's actually going on here. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that you bring that into this decision making because, um, you, you know, you've been around this enough that you're astute enough to recognize that this is not just one way communication. This uh, an ethical decision, especially when it's on the edge and in the gray zone, is probably not a one time decision that we're going to just close the book and move mm-hmm. on. 
And we need to understand, you know, I, I, I think there are two elements to that active listening. We need to understand kind of how this lands, right? We made this decision. We tell people about this thing. We need to Great figure point. out if they get it, right? Like we gotta, we gotta listen to see if they understand what we're saying. And then we also need to listen on that feedback loop because, you know, with COVID or with a new policy or we're opening up a new division in Japan or whatever it is, a month from now, a quarter from now, a year from now, these questions are going to need to be reevaluated and we need to be listening to our environment, to the people on our team and to everyone, all of our stakeholders to figure out if we can get some new information, some new principles, some new consequences that would maybe put us in, into a different phase of that decision. Absolutely. And we need to listen also to, to even more broadly, um, because, for example, it's very easy to say for someone like me, you know, Facebook had this Cambridge Analytica crisis and um, or it had these other crises with disinformation. And I'm going to go off of Facebook. You know, I have all kinds of access to other social media, to other Internet opportunities. But we're seeing right now in, in Myanmar, right Facebook is basically equivalent to the internet in certain countries. So it's all well and good for us to take decisions, um, especially about global companies and global challenges with ourselves in mind. Um, but I, if COVID has taught us one thing, it's that we should be thinking about all of these issues, including things like social media in the borderless way that our decisions actually have impact. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's more complex. We need to get sharper on it. Um, we can't we can't abdicate this conversation um, just because it's hard. It's it's on us, you know. I, I say that everyone's a leader. Everyone has a chance to influence someone else for good. So whether you have the title or not, absolutely. Uh, if you're if you're an ethics leader, it's more important. If you're a business leader, you know you're not just employing a thousand or a hundred thousand people. You're impacting all of their communities and their families and stuff like that. It's really important for us to get this right. Um, and you know I think that doing ethics well is going to be a big separator over the next five and 10 years of companies who get it and survive and thrive in the complexity and the edge and the gray uh, versus kind of keep doing business the old way and kind of miss the boat on how society needs them to behave these days. You know, I always tell um, corporate leaders in particular, but also NGO leaders and government leaders that ethics is your greatest strategic opportunity, right? That's my mm -hmm. positive spin as always. Um, however, if you fail to heed ethics, it will become your greatest risk. Yeah. Uh, and so I think, you know, I think you've said it really well. I think this is really the opportunity and anybody, as you've said, can be an ethics leader with or without a title. This is, you know, this is the whole point about democratizing ethics with or without education, with or without a title. Yeah, exactly. Um, everyone's part of it. Everyone is impacted by these decisions and these companies and these, these NGOs. Um, so we all need to be part of it. So as we wrap up, Susan, um, we touched on this a little bit earlier. I'd love to um, finish by hearing from you on this concept that uh, you bring about making this a conversation involving all levels. You talk to boards and CEOs, and you're probably more likely to get brought in by someone at that level than someone on the front lines ordering stuff in the cafeteria. But um, you, do, you do some great work helping leaders, you know, official title holders, um, and uh, you know, organization directors to make this a conversation, not just an edict. Talk to me a little bit about that, about how uh, that conversation is essential for the power of ethics to really uh, change humanity for the better. So one of the things that we have to do in order to have a broader societal conversation or a broader organizational conversation is to structure it. And in the book, um, and most of my work over the past uh, 10 years has been identifying six forces that I think affect every ethical decision we make to a greater or lesser extent, whether it's a big corporate decision or whether it's whether to take the car keys away from an elderly grandmother. Mm -hmm. And um, so these six forces can be you know, explained in a fairly uh, succinct way to anybody in an organization. And that can be sort of the, the way uh, conversations about any ethical challenge are structured. And people just, you know, between the framework and these six forces, they just start communicating in these terms so everyone is speaking the same language. Um, and the other thing is, even, even if boards and, um, and senior leaders are responsible for making decisions, and not everybody is going to love every decision they make, nor is that necessary, sure. they become used to thinking about explaining their decisions in those terms. So all of a sudden, everybody understands, as you said earlier, what the decisions are, what those bullet points are, but also how they got there. Um, and then there's just one other piece um, 
as we wind up, which is, you know, I talk a lot in the book about ethical resilience. And this comes back to the, you know, getting away from blame and shame and guilt. Nobody's perfect. No organization is perfect. But the more organizations uh, use these tools to make decisions, the more ethically resilient they're going to be. They're going to bounce back much more quickly. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to that, um, we can think about what happens when things really go off the rails. And these very same tools, my forward frame, my forward framework, and these six forces are exactly the same tools that can help you get back on the rails. If there's been, you know, a huge scandal or an individual that's gone off the rails, so it works from that standpoint as well. Yeah, it's really great. Um, I really love how the things that you boil down to the book they can help a board conversation, they can help a conversation at the divisional level with your team on an individual level. Um, it really, uh, I think you're really doing it, Susan, you're, demo- you're democratizing ethics because I can just see, you know, us getting this vocabulary, us, you know, having these conversations with our team and saying, hey, I, as the formal leader, looked at, you know, these principles, I looked at um, consequences, I, you know, kind of, uh, I, I, I went through these, uh, you know, these, um, these six pillars or six forces that, that go through, and then here's how I came to this decision. So, now you know kind of what my formula was. If you think that I'm off, then help me figure out where in this formula, oh, you didn't realize the contagion risk here, or you didn't realize the consequences exactly. that this is going to have on my family. So I think that decisions should be different because this variable in the equation, this step in the framework, I think we need to kind of open that back up again. And it could be really cool to have that dialogue with kind of some common language to get to better decisions and to get to a more cohesive group effort, you know, us moving forward toward the mission that we want. Um, I, I'm, I'm just really excited for the potential for the stuff that you have in this book, The Power of Ethics, to really transform the interactions that we have, not just the decisions we make, but how those decisions are disseminated, conversed around, and then maybe refreshed. Yeah, and you know, so one of my specialties in working with organizations is how do you have an organizational conversation? And mm-hmm. this works so much better and makes people feel so much more powerful and confident to speak up, mm-hmm. you know, even the most junior people then say, we're just going to call a town hall meeting and say whatever you want. Um, mm-hmm. so, so part of it is also giving people confidence. Yeah, it's, I mean, that's really powerful, right, to tell someone, hey, in this forum, here are the things that we're talking about. We're talking about stakeholders. We're talking about principles. Like, let's talk about those things. And then, you know, someone's not just saying, hey, I think the applesauce is too cold. They're kind of talking about something that's helpful to the conversation. But we as leaders, regardless of what your title is, we need to lead people into that discussion, not just say, hey, I put up a poster. I told someone to fill out the uh, comment box if they had something to say. They didn't, so I'm running forward. We have to figure out how to get them into that conversation so they can be part of the solution. No, exactly. Help them be confident about what to put in the comment box, so to speak. But ideally, as you say, have an organizational conversation. That's awesome. Um, Well, listen, Susan, there is plenty more in this book that um, I think can really transform someone's, uh, you know, career and leadership as as an ethics expert um, can help someone as a formal leader, an executive or on a board kind of drive ethics into their organization. And really, I think it's helpful for anyone who is impacted by and cares about these big decisions in companies and NGOs and our communities um, to understand where these breakdowns happen so we can hopefully do them better. The Power of Ethics is an awesome book, Susan. I so appreciate you writing this. Thanks for sharing it with the world. Um, And thanks for coming on The Ethics Experts today to chat with us. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here and such a pleasure to meet you. Um, Yeah, I'm so so glad you could join us, Susan. Thank you for coming on. Um, So uh, where should people look for this? Probably on Amazon. Anywhere else you want to send them to get in touch with Uh, Amazon, uh, yeah, Amazon, local bookstores, um, places like Third Point, um, some of the independent booksellers as well. Yeah, support your local booksellers. That's where the magic happens. Absolutely. Um, All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you to our audience for uh, listening to this discussion about the power of ethics, how to make good choices in a complicated world. Susan, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Um, I really hope that a bunch of people pick this book up, um, soak it in, put these principles into play um, within the organizations, because I think you're making the world better. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks again, Giovanni.